Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Venture Capital is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique corporate law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs, and by Detroit Venture Partners, an early stage fund with an all digital strategy. DVP is run by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Tune in today to see my guest, John Frankel. He's with FF Venture Capital, an early stage venture capital fund based out of New York City. You're not going to want to miss this. Yeah. Welcome to This Week in Venture Capital. My guest is actually a returning guest, and I had a great session with him in New York City, but today he joins me live in L.A. John Frankel, welcome. Thank you. Um, FF Venture Capital, we talked about it last time we met, but for people who missed that, why don't you give us the quick introduction to the firm? Um, so we're an early stage institutional angel investor. Uh, micro VC, super angel is how people describe us. I, I hate both terms because I think it really sort of misses the mark. But you're not really an angel because an angel would be just your own money. You're a venture capitalist, but you have a small size fund and you write the size checks that an angel might normally write. Is that fair? That is fair. But again, um, we don't. So the term super angel doesn't make sense. The term micro VC also somehow to us misses the mark. So we, we, we would love to what, come up with the right term. What, what problem do you have with micro VC? Um, venture, venture capitalists as a group. How about, how about seed stage VC? Yeah. You don't like VC? Do you, are you? Yeah. The answer is we're VC, but, <laughs> but we don't like the term VC um, because there's been so much destruction of capital by venture capitalists. Yeah. You know, the medium returns over um, many periods of time have led to venture capitalists generating zero return. But we, let's, and, let's, that, and that worries us. Let's peel back the onion on that, because a lot of people bring that up. And I think you're a very mathematical guy. I've spent time with you before. Um, venture capital as an asset class has performed abysmally, and everybody knows that, right? And right. that's like saying real estate performed abysmally in Japan in the 1980s. And what I mean is there were structural reasons our industry did poorly. And as you know, on average, commitments to venture capital as an industry through the 90s were 15 to $18 billion a year. On right. average, that's people who invested in VC funds who in turn invested in entrepreneurs. There was about 700 VCs in the mid 90s. The internet meant that we went from about 15 billion in commitments from LPs into VC funds to 110 billion per year in just three years time. It went that fast. And we went from 700 VCs to 2,400 VCs in about three years time. And the interesting thing about venture capital is, as you know, these are 10-year funds. So the hangover that started in 2000 didn't end until 2012 this year. And it's no doubt when you take an asset class from 15 billion to 110 billion, 700 artisan VCs to 2,400, the delta is going to create a lot of posers and a lot of bad performance. Uh, what's happened as of 2012, and I'm sure you know this, is we went back down to about 20 billion in total commitments to venture capital uh, last year, and the number of VCs went down to 700. And I, an interesting stat that I picked up uh, from an LP that we met with is that 98 funds in the U.S invested more than $4 million last year in venture capital, a million dollars per quarter, 98 firms, which means the, the size of the traditional venture capital, let's forget like early stage, traditional mm -hmm. venture capital is less than 100 firms. So I just want to kind of set the stage to say, I know our class has a kind of bad perception and I agree with you and there was a lot of sh stuff out there. <laughs> Um, but I think venture capital as an industry still is a great asset class for the high performers in our industry. Is that fair? Uh, yes and no. Okay. So yes, there was too much capital. But I also think there's a misalignment of incentives. Anyone who's running a billion dollar fund 
irrespective of their returns, if they're charging 2.5% management fees, will get paid out $250 million over the life of the fund in management fees. And the biggest incentive the managers of that fund have are obviously to generate returns for LPs, but also if they can raise a $2 billion fund, they can then get $500 million over the next 10 years. And so I think there's, there's a misalignment of interests, and this may be correlated with why, the large, the, um, why returns are higher in smaller funds. So that, that being said, I think the strong brands are attracting c capital, the ones who have a proven track record and have generated strong returns. And I think some of the early stage firms, to the extent that LPs can cut small checks, attracting capital because they're generating strong returns. And I think there's this sort of middle group of um, funds that may not be generating returns, could have not got the heft behind them, and those are the ones that I think are being winnowed out. I think they, for the most part, I think they've already been winnowed out. I don't see a lot of mediocre funds left in the market. I'm not going to say zero, but it's not like it was five or six years ago. And what I would say to you, what my observation is there's been the emergence of, on the early stage, this new class of investor of which I put you squarely in the middle of it, which is capital efficient, going for returns, not management fees, working hand in hand with entrepreneurs, and, and in the case of you, doing a lot more research than I see a lot of early stage VCs. Um, and every entrepreneur that I've spoken with um, who works with you just sings your praises about how active and involved you are, which is great, right? So seed stage, LP money has concentrated amongst billion dollar funds, you know, 80% of the money in venture capital last year went to about 11 funds. Correct. And so traditional VCs in my book have become growth stage rather than VCs. And unfortunately that's supported by what LP money is doing and LPs actually want to do that. And I think the real gap in the market right now is traditional VCs, hard way, 150 to $250 million funds doing what our industry used to do. I totally agree with that. Um, there is a gap there. And to be quite honest, if there's a lot of seed funds like ourselves investing in interesting companies, they're going to need those $100, $200 million size funds to fund the Series A's, the Series B's, the Series C's behind them. And there may not be enough capacity there. Do you know what I see happening? And I'm going to take questions in a moment because we get a couple good ones in the chat room here. But I see what's happening is this weird dichotomy, which is, um, first of all, on the LP side, you've got this haves and have nots of venture capital funds. Either you can raise almost an unlimited size fund. In the case of Andreessen Horowitz, I mean, right. I think they could raise whatever they want. And on the, and by the way, to be clear, I think it's because they've done phenomenal things. I think they're really smart about how they're building their firm. Um, in in uh, what I see going on in startup land is tons of seed stage, tons of accelerators, tons of angels. So a lot of companies getting financed. And because of the dearth of traditional VCs, what's happening is the five or 10 amazing upside surprises or hot companies raise money from the growth equity VCs uh, at almost unlimited prices because it's haves and have nots in startup land. So if you scale really quickly, suddenly your valuation is 300 million, 500 million, a billion, it do almost doesn't matter. And there's a lot of hard way, good companies that should be able to raise at 15 pre or 12 pre or 20 pre that are having a harder time doing that than they one day might have. I, I think that's true. Um, but I, I think there's a secular element to this I want to come to in a minute mm -hmm. um, as to why companies, I think companies can grow faster now than they've ever been able to grow, but which, which yeah, I want on. to come to. But, yeah. but you're, you're asking a financing question here. Yeah. And I, and I think on the financing side, uh, what we're doing is we're, create, we're, we're, we're sucking out of the rest of the economy entrepreneurs into the entrepreneurial side of the economy. 
And I think that's good. And I think whether a company gets funded yeah. or doesn't get funded, it's good because those that those talented people get recycled into the into the growth. Totally side. agree. And we're going to go to your secular theme in a moment. Uh, but I, I think it's worth entrepreneurs knowing because my perception, I've asked many VCs about this, is this is actually happening. You know, the overarching theme, I would say, is 10 million is the new 1 million. It was kind of Chris Dixon's post. And... You know, if you hit a million users these days, a lot of VCs that I know are still saying, well, I mean, a lot of people hit a million, which is astounding, right? If you hit 10 million, it's suddenly like, okay, you know, I have seven VCs chasing me. And I think there's some amount of that going on. I mean, totally. just perception. Um, so structurally, you believe, uh, well, so I'm sorry, I do want to go to a question first, which yes, is certainly. because MJ with them. Uh, ha, sorry, MG with him has asked the question, how do you define the difference between traditional VC and private equity? The larger the fund gets, the tougher, the tougher it is. They're all, at some level, they're all classes of private equity, but traditional private equity, people see as firms that come in and buy existing businesses, usually asset rich, maybe even cash flow rich, they restructure those businesses, and then they either sell them off, strip them down, IPO parts of them, and extract capital. So that is a different business than venture capital traditionally used to be, which is taking high-risk bets on not asset-rich companies, but on idea-rich companies that can come and change the world. And what we're seeing with some of the later stage funds, they're buying secondary stock in companies, and I don't use the term buying logos, but they're investing in those companies, but they're making the kinds of bets that Fidelity makes when it buys public market stock. <laughs> and it's a, it's, that to me is not really venture capital, and yet that's where some of the LP capital is going. I was just laughing because uh, I don't want to say buying logos, but they're buying <laughs> logos. <laughs> well, no, no, but if you say it that way, it's almost like... I don't want to say they're buying logos, but did I just say that out loud? <laughs> I actually wrote a blog post saying I think a lot of people are buying logos. And I think it's not just VCs who are buying logos. I think entrepreneurs are buying logos. And I think it's a terrible trend. It's what I call party rounds. Party rounds is when I go take five VCs, they're all great logos, and each one of them gets 200K and I raise a million bucks. And the problem is if you don't succeed immediately, immediately up and to the right, then you've got five people who feel like, well, I don't know, it wasn't me, I wasn't the lead, and nobody's stepping up to help. And if you're suddenly amazingly up into the right, you have five VCs fighting you for allocation. Yeah, we, we call those investments a horse of a different color. A horse of a different color, what does that mean? Uh, it's, uh, it's <laughs> Is that a British thing? <laughs> it's a reference to the Wizard of Oz, it's also a reference to color. Oh, it is, okay. Well, uh, so, uh, you believe that there is a structural, secular thing that's going on in technology. Why don't you describe that? Okay. So uh, th th this is sort of something that upsets me somewhat at the moment. The, in, in the media, the big themes that are being talked about, the big macro themes are all cyclical. We talk about what happens with Japan and China, and is there going to be a war there? We talk about Europe. We talk about commodities. We talk about lack of food. We talk about uh, the fiscal cliff. We talk about debt. We talk about entitlements. But what we seem to be missing is this massive technological wave that's hitting us. And I think we're going through a period equivalent to the Industrial Revolution. And just to set color to the Industrial Revolution, 1730 to 1850, life expectancy in rural England in 1730 was about 19. That doesn't mean if you were 20, you were an old person. 19 was the life expectancy. At birth. So, at, so a lot of people died was in that the first the few years. Was that wars or pestilence? Or? Pestilence, what, child delivery, the whole series of stuff. Bad, you had a car, bad, bad dentistry? <laughs> well, you're picking on England now. Um, but, put it, but what happened was by 1850, rural life expectancy yeah. went to 38 years. By 1900, 45 years today, it's around about 78, and it's improving about uh, a month every year. Mm -hmm. so, so there was this massive change in life expectancy. And you live in a world where life expectancy is 19. 
religion and other things that you can, are the things you can control. And there's all these uncontrollable things, and you see a lot of death around you. It's a different society than it became as we came into the 20th century. We moved from a rural economy to a machine-driven economy, and we took all of these farm hands and we taught them to be machinists. Mm -hmm. And we had a period of 15 years or so of structural unemployment, a period of centralization, big machine, lots of people around them, and decentralization, where we pushed machines out on wheels and we created transportation such as trains, we uh, combine harvesters, other things. So an enormous change in society. And during that, people saw bits of it, but they didn't necessarily join back to, oh, we're in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. And I think we're going through something similar today. Um, I think we're going through changes in society because of technology and because of the way people are interacting with technology they are going to be just as significant. And I believe some of the structural unemployment we're seeing today is due to this change. And we have a Fed, and this is for those who have an economics bent, but a Fed who is trying to solve a, what I think is a secular structural problem mm -hmm. with a cyclical solution with keeping interest rates low right. and causing untold problems down the road. So w what do you think it, government ought to be doing? Well, let, let's talk about what government is. Well, let's talk, about, let's talk a little bit more about why I think... You know, what sure. are the indicators? What, okay. are, what, are, what are the dots I'm joining? So there was a story of, I don't know if you saw about Karen, the bus monitor. Who, so this was a woman who was 68. She was bullied. She monitored a bus for 12, 13-year-olds in New York State. Bullied terribly. <clears throat> Someone took a video of it, put it on Reddit. Someone took that video. I think his name was uh, Alex Sobolov, and I, I apologize, Alex, if that's your name, if I miss pronounced or misspelled it, but, um, and put it on Indiegogo, which is, happens to be one of our portfolio companies, and said, let's raise $5,000 for Karen, for a vacation. And this video went viral. Yep. And $703,000 later, Karen had either a great vacation or was able to retire. And someone actually put a campaign on Indiegogo and said, actually, sorry, the guy was Max. Mm -hmm. so apologies, Max. Said Max has done such a great job that Max should get a vacation. Let's raise two and a half thousand for him, and, and seven and a half thousand was raised. That to me was the power of people, of frustration expressing itself. And that I thought was interesting. But that to me has an equivalence with the pink slime problem we had, where parents indignantly put their hands up and said, my kid should not be eating this, whether it's at McDonald's or whether it's a school cafeteria. Or the Arab Spring, which started off as leadless revolutions, where people said, this is just not right. And all of this has been enabled by social media. And what social media has allowed is powers move from the center, from government and from brands, down to individuals. Yep. And individuals now, in a very low friction way, can express themselves and, the, and drive society in a way they couldn't before. And so you're empowering the powerless. Um, 3D printing is an example of that. I'm sure you saw there was a, pro a project that actually got funded to 3D print mm -hmm. guns. That I moves power that. from government wow. to individuals. Now, whether it should be there or not, that's a different case. But 3D printing of guns it's powerful. 3D printing of organs, which is also just starting to happen, is incredibly powerful. There's an article in Wired magazine, I think it was about 10 years ago, that said if you live for the next 30 years, you'll be able to live forever. And an inductive argument that you'll be able to extend life expectancy by 30 years by technology coming through. And we're starting to see elements of that, the 3D printing of organs, the ability, if you have cancer, to find out exactly the genetic composition of cancer versus you and what kills the cancer and hopefully won't harm you and continue to target and monitor that. Those technologies are coming immensely enabling. And so, the, so through this, I but think it, we'll but see... As you, but as you know, the world can't support a... Uh, ecosystem in which humans have uh, no end, right? Okay, where so, population growth will cause other problems. So, so I, we know how the industrial revolution worked out, yeah. and it was a net net. We'll say it was good because we survived it. Yeah. 
I, I can paint a lot of dystopian, a lot of bad outcomes out of this. Because what's happening is the center doesn't like losing power. Brands don't like losing power. Governments don't like losing power. And so they're pulling power back. And they're trying to pull power back by monitoring everything. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole series of brand monitoring tools that are out there. But governments... So California, I don't know if you saw, just passed legislation, um, either passed or proposed, but I believe it passed... Um, saying that companies can't use social media to monitor their employees. Um, I didn't see the details of the law. I think it said it can't make employees give up passwords. But so a lot of a lot of social a lot of social media uh, companies have APIs, and data can be analyzed from those APIs. So there's this tension between the two, between individuals who are being empowered, and between the center, which is trying to pull power back. And we, we're optimists, but like, you can definitely paint a number of dystopian outcomes from here. You know, the power of an individual who wants to, for ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, go and learn how to create a virus that kills a lot of people is becoming increasingly possible. Not a good outcome. You know, uh, so if we talk about societal change and societal change not discussing good or bad, right. um, unquestionably we're moving towards more democratization. And that has huge positives, uh, power to the individuals, power to groups not to be oppressed by the center, right? So sure. I, I agree with that. And, um, and we also need to be aware that transparency also points out to have nots what the haves have. Correct. Right. So if you live in North Africa and you don't understand just how much wealth the U.S. or Europe has acquired relative to you, you probably feel OK with your normal life uh, as long as government leaves you alone. The moment you start to look out there and realize just how much wealth is being accumulated in your town or community is not part of it. Uh, it leads to a certain humiliation uh, of societies that I think cause rebellions and cause people to uprise. So uh, the same tools that are empowering people are also frustrating people. So it's kind of two, end, two ends of the same sword. Yes, it's turmoil. Yeah. And I don't know the outcome. Uh, the other aspect is I think technology enables massive wealth concentration in a short period of time. And so the people who understand this, I think, will make significant amounts of money, and you end up with this pulling of society apart between the people who are being disrupted, pushed out of jobs, the structural unemployment, just as we saw during the Industrial Revolution, is happening now. And I think the uptick, going from a farmhand to a machinist, was probably an easier transition than taking people who work on, in a car plant and making them part of the entrepreneurial growth economy. And, and, and so it's tough. So just so that we make sure we state the exact thing, I don't know if you're able to tap into my computer here, uh, but you're exactly right. Um, if we find a way to tap into the computer here, thank you. Uh, California raises the bar on social media privacy, and I'm just going to try to make that a little bit bigger. And basically, it says California residents can keep their passwords to themselves in school and in the workplace. The assembly passed a law, uh, the first comprehensive social media privacy legislation that protects employers, employees, and job applicants from having to grant access. So you're right. But, but at the sa in the same vein, as you mentioned, um, that if this information is public, it allows people to get access yeah. to it. I, I think people go through their life with different identities. Whether it, we can look in the online world, but in the offline world, in the real world, I think people have a private self they just don't want to share with anyone. Their innermost thoughts, things that they, do, they just don't want to share. And then they have a family self. Mm -hmm. And that may be the friends and family self, maybe the same self, maybe separate. And then they have a public self, how they want to represent themselves publicly. And then those who are dating have a dating self, which is usually a pseudonym, and the person is two inches taller and 20 pounds lighter. <laughs> um, and you know, there are these four selves. And I think increasingly, as people are using social media and exchanging private information for tools, you know, I want to share photos with people, or I get tagged in that photo, or I want to comment on this, you're actually giving up a little, a tiny little bit of well, privacy. As people do that, they're getting something back. 
But I think what they will want is a way to manage this public self so that when someone looks up Mark Seuss or someone looks up John Frankel, yeah. what's represented is something that you have some control over or I have control over. I think that's the world we're moving to. And you can validate that I'm six foot two, right? I have to I, tell you I, a funny I, story. I, I would say you're six foot three. But. I, I, went to, <laughs> I went to a conference and I saw a guy and he says, hey, you're Mark Seuss. I watched your show and, and I said, yeah, you know, nice to meet you. And he says, Gosh, I thought you'd be so much taller. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. I guess, you know, I have that John Stewart thing. Um, so here's the thing about privacy. Um, I think, of course, there is a privacy creep. And I think that when you're young, you probably think about it less. But companies also have a responsibility to think about what stuff should be maintained privately. Uh, I don't know. Did you follow the Quora scandal? Scandal, if I want to call it that. Yes. So Quora made the decision to start sharing what articles you're reading without telling you. And they maybe announced it, but they, it was opt out, not opt in. And the thing that upset me the most about that is to me, that's the equivalent of Google deciding to publish what websites you go to. And I just think that's a complete creep on the trust that people have placed in a website like Quora that what you read is your own privacy. Now, if you take explicit action, mm. if you like something, if you vote something up, if you share something, I think society understands that those actions are likely to be visible to others. But I think what you read is what you read. Um, I agree. And tell me, how long did it take Quora to reverse it? About a week. And it, it took a week because people who were frustrated had a platform to go out and say, this is wrong. Right, so so it's. A, I think we're working it out. I told you, there's t there's turmoil. We're working out where those boundaries I, are. I, I accept that. The the lesson I want entrepreneurs to know is that if you're a Quora, and you were founded by one of the original team of Facebook, and you are backed by Benchmark Capital, and you've raised tons of money, and you are a darling of Silicon Valley, you can get away with the privacy creep. I believe that if you're a younger company and maybe don't have the same resources, that can be an existential blow. And I think you really need totally to be agree. careful about trying to grow too fast in ways that may come back to prove that you're not a trustworthy company. I to totally agree. Trust is something that is tough to earn and easily lost, just like reputation. And companies and entrepreneurs really need to manage it. And the... Uh, it's a little bit like the Wild West here with regard to access to information, what's put out there. And if people are not responsible, there will be massive problems. And you have to be able to understand there's a problem, know about it, and address it if you do something wrong. And no one's perfect. So companies will make mistakes. How they recover from those mistakes is as much a, a test as a company. But you're right, it can be existential. Now, back to your idea about this industrial revolution, because I tend to agree with your argument, which is, you know, even as I say incubators, right, incubators and accelerators right now in my mind are being overdone. I think if we want to call it a mini bubble of accelerators. But on the other hand, I actually think it's a net positive because even if they don't all succeed and even if all the companies don't succeed, we've given people an opportunity, a platform to go from big corporates to trying to start their own business. And I think that's a net positive for all of us, I, giving them the right tools. I mean, it's a huge positive. I look at incubators really as just formalized angel groups. Right? They invest in one round, they give advice and help the company, and then the company moves on and they go and deal with the next group. The biggest difference, John, is someone who's heavily involved with mm -hmm. one, so I, I'm not unbiased. Um, uh, I'm involved with Launchpad LA here in town. Um, the biggest difference is if you're backed by an angel, you're still likely working in your office or in your home and not exposed to a community in the same way you are as part of an accelerator. For example, uh, this week we brought in Steve Blank to meet with our teams. Last week we brought in the CTO of the United States to meet with our teams. We're constantly bringing in investors and uh, senior leaders from the community and we're helping them with mentorship and whatever. And I grant you that angel investors also do those things. So I'm not trying to say one's better necessarily or worse. But there is a kind of leverage and scale advantage that you get from being in a colo facility because Steve Blank is not going to go to 12 individual people's offices and okay. meet with them. No, I totally agree. And by the way, I don't see angel investors as a sort of pejorative term. 
right. either. I think they're, no, they're, no, essential, I think they're a central community and they yeah. have some of the highest returns of any investors in the space. The reason why we focus on the angel space is because we think there's huge returns there, and those returns are there because individuals are willing to risk their capital. I see incubators in a similar light in that they tend not to invest in the Series A and the Series B and be there through the life of the company. They're launching the company, involved in the earliest That stage. attribute and, is the and, same, I right. agree with and, that. And so that, that, that's kind of like how I see them. Um, and some people sometimes refer to us a little bit like an incubator. I go, well, yes and no, because you know, as you know, we're a small firm. We have 15 employees, including three interns. But what what else makes you unique? I was talking with someone who took money from you, um, and what he said to me, you know, he's trying to raise money, and he said. John was so thorough in his due diligence for a seed stage investment that I feel like any A investor, if he shares all the stuff he's produced, will have a very easy time analyzing our company. He was surprised at the degree of analysis that you did on a seed stage investment. Yes, we, we, we kind of like, once we get to term sheet, we almost apologize for the level of due diligence we're going to put people through. Uh, we think it's important. We think it's an important part of sort of the company growing up to be able to provide that information. It's one of the reasons why we provide accounting services at cost to our portfolio companies. Even if any of our CEOs were CPAs, we wouldn't want them spending the time doing the accounting. We want really clean, scrubbed books, balance sheets that put projections that make sense so that a later stage investor comes and looks at the company and they know that it's been scrubbed through our due diligence, the accounting works, and the, you know, we've worked strategically with a company. So, so it's, it's part of what we're doing. So at some level, it's, there's an incubation aspect to it, but we're not like incubators in that we don't stay. We like to invest in multiple rounds. So obviously one benefit you get to that is that you yourself have better visibility of the numbers, but um, do you think that helps with you getting follow-on investors because they know there's a certain transparency and trust that they can get from the companies that they're looking at in your portfolio? That's our thesis, yes. That's our perspective. That's interesting. Um, and, the, and, and by the way, the companies benefit. Right. Right. They don't know what they don't know, and we help them know what they don't know. They think accounting is just bookkeeping. It isn't. Yeah, and I've seen other people uh, who do these kind of back office infrastructural type things for their startups, and I think that's great. Um, God, I'm totally blanking on the name. I'm going to whack myself on the head later if I don't think of it, but I'll come back to it. But there's another firm based out of Boston that I've worked with that, that does exactly this. They have part of their firm that helps with uh, inside sales. They have a part of their firm that helps with PR. And so their view is that in the earliest stages – um, it's hard for these companies to have the scale to be able to do all these functions well. So by centralizing it and offering it at cost, they can help entrepreneurs focus on their yeah. core business. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. And so we help with recruiting, we help with mentor networks, we help with um, uh, pulling decks together, um, spreading best practice amongst our CEOs, getting our CEOs together. You know, when you sit, you know, it blows me away when I sit down with a dinner of our CEOs we have people, because we're generalists, we have people from all different industries, but they're all, you know, A-plus players in the room. And I just sit there and I just feel incredibly privileged, you know, and the quality of the conversation and the things that, that come out of it are, um, you know, quite amazing. We, we, we don't do it frequently enough. So it's OpenView is the firm. Okay. OpenView, I just blanked momentarily on that. Have you worked with them? Um, not that I know of. They have, they have really nice kind of back office mm -hmm. services. I, uh, I've talked to some friends of mine who work with them who have raved about that offering. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do, mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think it's the right way to do it. Um, back to the theme of industrial revolution. Yes. What's interesting to me is that, and, and this came from my discussion with Steve Blank, who I had on the show last, is... If you look back to management tools that came after the Industrial Revolution, and the U.S. probably led in that, in management practices of how you run large corporations, and that led to the growth of uh, the MBA and the professional manager and management theory and Mintzberg and all these people who came after who came up with a lot of management theory. But management theory for running traditional companies in 
businesses that have a business model but are not searching a business model is very different than management practices for startups. And I think the way that we structure ourselves to deal with all the startups and the changes to how society works when, when you have a startup society, I think will be our next big challenge. I totally, totally agree. I mean, I sat down with um, the dean of one of the leading uh, business schools, and we had a sort of half-hour meeting, and we spent about an hour and a half talking about this. And I said, you, you, you've had this factory this conveyor belt of just sending people to Wall Street. And I go, that conveyor belt's slowing down. And when I look in the startup economy, often an MBA is a red flag. It's not a positive. It's an indication that you've got to actually retrain your thinking around how to manage what you're doing. And I said, I see kids who've gone to great schools. They spent a couple hundred thousand, maybe deep in debt, getting a, education one of our finest institutions and the first thing they do is learn to code right i go we've got to teach our kids in high school to code for sure at the same time my high school has my, my school system my town school system in new jersey has stopped teaching cursive writing no one no one writes longhand anymore it's That's so teach them to code yeah and uh you know i guess when i think about uh, Guy Kawasaki's statement about how you value an early stage startup. Have you heard this? No, tell me. He said, um, well, so let's say you have seven people. He says, um, you, t you give a million dollars of valuation for every engineer and you subtract a million dollars for every MBA. <laughs> so uh, sort of joking. I mean, I have an MBA and I, I um, you know, I, in, in many ways, I think I gained from it. But um, I have a practice at GRP, my firm, of hiring pre-MBAs. And I, I greatly prefer it to post-MBAs because for me, the difference between a pre-MBA and post-MBA is as follows. A pre-MBA, I can judge how smart are they, how well did they do in undergrad, you know, did they have like the basic training of analysis that I'm going to need for them to be successful on the job. Then they go get an MBA. They suddenly take on $75,000, $100,000 of debt. Uh, they've had no income for two years. Their peer groups who go to Wall Street and hedge funds and whatever else are earning huge salaries. So they graduate with a need to pay back all this debt and a peer group that has a really high salary, and they deliver me no additional value. Well, I mean, look, I don't want to hit on, you know, on, MB, on MBAs as such. I just think we need to change the MBA coursework to make it more relevant for the entrepreneurial startup society going forward. And, you know, we, we have uh, some founders who are MBAs, and they're great, but we j just generally sort of, you know. But I think there's a golden opportunity, and maybe someone like Steve Blank or Eric Reese is at the core of this, and maybe Eric, that maybe this ought to be Eric Reese's next business, which is I think there's an opportunity to train people in six months, nine months, 12 months, to be entrepreneurial leaders and give them that toolkit and have them graduate with zero debt or maybe it costs 10,000 or 15,000 to go through it or maybe there could be a Kickstarter like system where people actually fund them to go through this training so they don't need to earn for a year and then get paid back in wages in the future. But it seems to me that if we're really gonna train our next generation of entrepreneurial leaders, it's not gonna be by saddling them with $100,000 of debt so, two years out of their job life at the most critical time in their life. Totally agree, totally agree. One of the reasons why we take in two to three interns continually is because we find that it's a great way to give them exposure and for us to get really talented uh, folks into our organization. And the same with our startups, we encourage them to use interns. And, and it's just part of sort of recycling and refeeding um, so the ecosystem. You and I had been introduced via email. We had known each other online. But the very first time, if I'm not mistaken, that we met in person was at South by Southwest. Am Correct. I right? <laughs> and we were at a cocktail party. And there were lots of interesting companies around. And there was an early stage company that you were an investor in that you were beating the drums of that I was unpersuaded about. And when I say unpersuaded, I was not a detractor because I love the CEO, the founder, um, I am interested in the technology, but I wasn't yet convinced why this is a big idea. And you were very early in clout, mm. a very big initial supporter of clout. 
Um, and you had a vision for it. And you, when you have a vision for things, you're, you become a great cheerleader for them. Uh, what is it you saw back then? And, and how has that changed? And how is it evolving? And then talk a bit about their Microsoft deal and what you think that represents. So, you know, I sat down with Joe Fernandez, gosh, November 2009, I think. Uh, he was in New York uh, fundraising, and I called him back the following week and said, hey, Joe, I'd like to find out some more. And he goes, why are you calling me? I go, what do you mean? He goes, yours was the worst meeting that I had in New York. In fact, I You're was worried me. that you were going to call every other investor in New York and tell them not to invest. That's so funny. And, and I go, Joe, well, not true, uh, but, you know, as some level, if you don't present well, I don't care. I care about the underlying concept. And I said, I see something here. And I said, what I see is that in four or five years from now, people are going to care about their online footprint. They're going to care about their online identity. And they're leaving like little footprints in all different places on MySpace or Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus, you know, well, actually, I guess Google Plus one there, but, you know, on, on, you know, in different places. And they'll want a way to, like, aggregate this together and manage this public persona of themselves. And I go, cloud could become that company. And that's kind of what we saw. We felt that it was increasingly important that though only, you know, I mean, Twitter's grown dramatically since then, Facebook's grown dramatically since then. But we saw that these becoming mainstream, the social media was coming mainstream, that this was going to create a problem for individuals, and individuals would want a way to handle it. And, and the recent release of Clout Moments, yep. honestly, is a great way. What is Clout Moments? And what Clout Moments does, you go and register at clout.com, yep. you tie up your Twitter account, your Facebook account, et cetera, you can tie up 11 social networks. And what it does is it surfaces the things you did that were most influential, that moved your clout score most. And for most people, maybe one or two things a week. And you can look at a 90-day history of those items surface and who shared it. And then you as an individual can edit out and say, well, this political thing that got everyone fired up, I actually don't want that out there. But the rest of it is then available as an SEO-friendly public page, which really is a representation of yourself. So Facebook, and this problem with Facebook about giving people, giving people access to your Facebook, Facebook's kind of private, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on there. But there are certain things that you may be happy surfacing out of there. On Twitter, it's a noisy stream. But there are certain things where you really have an interaction with people, you'd be happy surfacing it. So could, uh, could you bring up my computer for a moment? So I'm bringing up now. You can see here, John, if you look up on the screen, this is my moments. So my search volume on Bing has increased over the past 90 days. Interesting. Um, I tweeted a quote from my wife, behind every successful man is a surprised woman, which, which I and, found pretty and funny. 60, and 60 people yeah. really engaged with that. But, here, but interesting, that's from July of 2012. It's had, it had a lot of engagement. Yeah, so this is not about recency, but this is like the most engaged stuff. This is interesting. I've never seen this before. And, so and, and th if, I, these if are, I was meeting you for the first time, yeah. and I wanted to understand a little bit about you. I can go to your LinkedIn page, yeah. but this page is significantly more informative. And so this is publicly available. Everyone can see what is the content that I put out that's the most influential or right. maybe th this isn't a way like a curated list well, of... Well, you can curate it. No, but I, I can curate it? Yeah, so if you... If you uh, so if, this says view all recent moments, v view public, right. recent Twitter, recent Facebook right. moments. So you... Right, so See you can do that, but also on any one in the top right-hand corner, you can exit out. You can put, in, you can click the X and take it out of your public stream. You can, okay. Yes, and so this this is the first stage towards allowing you to surface your best content to represent yourself. So I have to tell you that this is the coolest thing I've seen come out of cloud. Not that other things weren't cool, but I really like this in a way. I like the LinkedIn analogy because this is saying if you want to get a kind of sense of Mark Suster and what, what kind of information is he putting out, if I go to Twitter and I just look at my last 10 tweets, that, 
That's not that instructive. I do that a lot, by the way, when I'm going to meet someone. I'm like, well, let me see what they're saying publicly. Let, let me kind of understand who this individual is. And this seems like a great way to do that. Yep. And what I have to tell you, the other thing that I like, if we stay on the screen for a minute, is who are my influencers? Dave McClure, Fred Wilson, Paul Kodrowski, Chris Dixon. That's pretty darn instructive of like people that are fairly influential with me and interacting with me. Uh, Drew Olinoff, who's a friend, um, uh, I, he's influential mostly on the topic of the Philadelphia Eagles, who we tend to tweet each other right. a lot and, about. And you may say, Drew's a friend. Yeah. I want to X him out of this and take him off this list because I don't want that shown publicly. Well, I wouldn't. Uh, no, I like you wouldn't. Drew. I, and he's a writer, at, at, he's a writer at, um, at TechCrunch, and you know he's doing interesting stuff. And I guess these are people who gave me clout and stuff like that. What I struggled with initially was... Um, I'm just going to try to click and see if I can show more, was they used to do this mapping of like who influences you and who right. you influence. And none of it felt that accurate to me in the past, but it's gotten to a point where it's, get, it, it's look, looking pretty darn good. Look, I'm not even sure we're, if we're in the first innings of this. We may be in the pregame. Yeah. But the reality is this is going to be very important to people. And whether you like clout or hate clout, People who know about clout, they care about their clout score. Yeah. One of my LPs contacted me. He said, I was in the Hong Kong lounge of Cafe Pacific. Yeah. And he said, if your clout score is above 40, you can get into this lounge. I said, that's pretty cool. He said, yeah, they had you know, material there that said that. That's that pretty it's cool. It's beginning to get mainstream. The Bing deal is a great example of mainstreaming clout. But in a way... Um what we're really measuring, I guess, here, and we can go off the computer now, what we're really measuring, I guess, here is authority to an extent, right? That's what we're trying to get at is how authoritative are you? And I guess to some extent, we need to know how authoritative are you by topic because right. you probably don't want to trust me for wine recommendations, um, but on venture capital stuff, I guess I'm okay. Right, and cloud tracks it across thousands of topics, they reduce it to one simple aggregate score, but they have scores by every topic, which is accessible through the API. So if you were looking for wine enthusiasts, yep. and you, that can be surfaced, and that's, that's the backbone of the Clout Perp program. I want to bring something out of the uh, chat room, which is earlier we talked about the need to help people, investing in people and redeveloping right. themselves. Um, both M G Witham and Grant C O V Grant Cove um, have mentioned a company called uh, where is it Upstart.com, which Mark Cuban is an investor in. I don't know that company. Do you know them? I I don't know the company. Well, while you, why why don't you tell me about the Bing deal and why you do? I'll try to bring up Upstart.com. So, the the Bing deal is there's two elements to the deal. There's an investment by Microsoft. Yep. Um, so, you know, the, I wouldn't put this in the same category as Microsoft's investment in Facebook, but it's still, you know, important validation for the company. Yep. And then there's what I think is much more important, a multi-year partnership to work out how Bing and potentially Microsoft can work closer with cloud. And so let me ask you a question. You get an e email from someone you don't know. Yep. Would it be interesting to see their cloud score next to it as to whether... It's spam or not, because if they have a cloud score of about zero and no one interacts with them, then it's probably not a real person. If they have well, a cloud of the, score of 75 and you've never heard of them, you go, maybe I'll click that. One of the things that I thought was interesting. And that's, that, but I just want to yeah. say, that's, I'm just sort of spitballing here. It's not that that's within the no, plan no, no, of what I, I was, doing, but I'm giving examples of how deeper integration could to go. totally get it. So um, one of the things that I thought was interesting that Cloud announced a while back is that they were start going to start taking offline measures of influence as well as how active you are on social media and other things, right? Correct. And hopefully that should produce better scores because I know quite influential people who just don't like being in social media and th those two things combine really ought to determine one's clout. If you're a hermit, yeah. they're not going to find you. If you're, if, you run, if you're a hedge fund manager who runs three or four billion dollars yep. and you don't like being quoted in the press and you don't like, uh, you're not on social media, clout's not going to find you. But then again, most people won't find you. You'll be influential in a small group of people, but right. not mass influential. However, 
uh, the offline influence, the changes they put through came out the same time as clout moments, really has solved what we call the Warren Buffett problem, which was that I had a higher clout score than Warren Buffett. Right. And, you know, that's been resolved. Um, and so, and, and again, we're in the early stage. There'll be more iterations, there'll be more data, and as there's more data and more analysis and refinement to the algorithms, it'll get better. But it's pretty good, um, I think, for where it is today. Yeah, I, I'm impressed with, with where they've gone. Can we bring up my computer again? So this is Upstart. It says, Upstart lets you raise money in exchange for a small share of your income for 10 years. It's an investment in you, not your ideas or your business. Pursue your dreams with guidance from backers who believe in your aspiration. And they have this kid, Jeremy Clapian, uh, Harvard Law School, 2012. I have a whiteboard full of startup ideas, but the risk of striking out on my own, um, I guess, blah, blah, blah. The uh, risk of striking out on my own is too great when one misstep will lead to drowning in student loan debt. So this is a guy who's put his goal, and we can back him if we want. I think that's a clever idea. I think, I think it's smart. It's, it's part of this enabling of technology, taking friction away. Um, I think the Jobs Act, when we finally see the SEC's uh, refinement on it, um, could be really good. That may lead to lots, lot more fraud. Yeah. Um, but I think net net will be a positive for society. Now, I certainly hope so. I want to change the conversation to the biggest company in Los Angeles that nobody's ever heard of. And this is another company that you were a very early stage investor in. You remained bullish all throughout the growth of the company. You remained bullish after even they went public uh, from our last conversation. And it seems like this is a huge growing business that very few people talk about. Talk about them. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the phrase that you hate to hear. Okay. Which is... Oh, don't say it. Silicon Beach. Ah, damn it. Um, so, you know... I think LA suffers from having an enormous number of engineers mm -hmm. and an enormous amount of technology talent, but without a sense of identity. And Silicon Beach was a term that was coined to try and say, we're like Silicon Valley, but you get some of the benefits of actually, you know, good climate and, 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 and the like. I'm just going to call bullshit on that. Honestly, let's talk <laughs> about Cornerstone. But like, if you're going to veer into that, I will tell you, is New York lacking no, an identity? No, I'm, I'm going to veer away from Do that. I come to New York because you have Silicon Alley? <laughs> I mean, come no, on. That's my point. I want to veer away from that. However... Within LA, there's a because it's so di because it's more spread out. There isn't this sense of concentration. It's more spread out than where, John? The most. I'm so tired of like the uh, bullshit okay. ideas people have of LA. If you look at Northern California, okay, yep. how long do you think it takes you to drive from San Francisco to San Jose on most days? I mean, this is a guy who grew up in Northern California who lived there. Right, about an hour no, and twenty minutes. No, I, I, how long does it take you to drive from one side of LA to the other? About an hour and twenty minutes. It'll take longer. How long does it take you in New York City? How long does it take no. to get from New Jersey to Connecticut? You know? I, no, no, no. I understand that. The the, the, but, the biases of LA are strong. People have these biases that it's about the beach, that it's about Hollywood, that it's this traffic uh, laden place, and to some extent, this in every community, some of the stereotypes are of course true. But when you live in a community Community. You don't decide to live in Pasadena and work in Manhattan Beach. It just doesn't happen. I, no, I agree with you, but there isn't this sense of identity, and that's why people... There isn't a it, sense no, of identity in who? And people in New York don't have a sense of identity for L.A.? For L.A. tech. And I, just, I just don't buy it. I yeah, don't buy no, the premise. So what I was trying to lead to was I think the term Silicon Beach is a term that should be lost. I think the term should be some, something like LA Tech. It should, there's no reference to silicon. It references to technology and the references to LA. But, but you asked me about Cornerstone. Yes, please. Let's so, talk about so Cornerstone. Back in 2002, yeah. um, uh, I invested in Cornerstone. There were, um, I think, four employees. Four. Uh, how they did ended you, how the, did you find them? So a good friend of mine... Um, bumped into the head of sales in the gym mm -hmm. and got to know him, cut them a check, and then said to me, hey, John, this is a great company. You should get to know them. So I cut them a check. And were they in L.A. still back they then? Was, they okay. were in L.A. And I just got to know them over time. And the more I saw, the more I really liked what they were doing. 
and continued to invest and invested seven times before they went public. Why do you think they've been so successful? What would you attribute? The, well, first of all, tell us what Cornerstone On Demand does and tell us what you believe the successful attributes have been. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe a company to you. Okay. Think of a company that uh, has 11 million enterprise seats, the most enterprises are in there in every seat, that has social... Uh, and so they have the ability to socially connect, a bit like an internal enterprise Facebook, but also has um, a module for recruiting, a module for um, performance reviews, a module for succession planning, a module for online training, a module to teach your customers extended networks. That's what Cornerstone is. And they work with the largest companies in the world. Does it compete and not to, you don't have to do one for one comparison, but is the closest thing success factors? Is that? Yes. Yeah, success okay. factors was, um, uh, was purchased. How um, much was it bought for? Do you remember? I'll, I'll look it up. Don't I'll worry. say 3 yeah. billion, but I'm okay. not sure. Gotcha. Um, and, but success factors was very strong on performance, mm -hmm. but not on, e, not on e-learning. And e-learning is a really tough module to put together. The difference really between Cornerstone and any of their competitors today is they've grown up organically. All the modules were built on the same core infrastructure. Uh, they're the only pure SaaS player in the marketplace. And for the last five years, they've grown revenues about 60% a year. And since they've gone public, revenue seem to have accelerated. They went public April, sorry, March last year. The pricing range was 9 to 11. They priced at 13. First trade was 17. I don't know where it's trading today. Yesterday was around about 31. Um, and I think the stock's up 60% or more year to date. And if you think about it, other things being equal, if you can grow revenue at 60% a year prospectively, which gets tougher as numbers get bigger, but if you can, then the stock price should grow accordingly. And so, what, what's intriguing is yep. this is a story that no one knows about. It's a billion and a half dollar. I know, it's crazy. Right? LA success story and the, the founding CEO, so the CEO, the head of sales, and the CFO today with three of those four people in the room when I invested. That's awesome. And, and so, that, you know, to me, that's the, that's the most wonderful thing, to see these people succeed like this. So if we could bring up my screen for a moment, um, you'll see here that Success Factors was bought for $1.2 billion, which is now less than the value of Cornerstone. You'll see right here uh, the market cap of Cornerstone's $1.55 billion. And look at the chart. It, it, you know, even just since IPO, it's up 70%. I don't remember the stock tip from you calling me before IPO. <laughs> <laughs> Saying, Mark, this is about... Actually, that's not true, because every time I talk to you about Cornerstone On Demand, you tell me what a great company it is. Yeah, and it's just run by great people. And when I look at them, they're firing on all cylinders. And the, the interesting thing about them is when they win a large... So if you've got... The normal model for SaaS is you start with smaller clients and work larger. They, made, they took it tougher. They said, let's go for the largest enterprises. And the interesting thing is when you land a company like Barclays, mm -hmm. you land, say, 10,000 seats in one product. And over the next four or five years, you move to try and get every seat in every product. And the marginal cost of acquisition of those incremental seats is significantly less. And, so, and then, by which point you've added, you've added another product over that period or another two products over that period that you can sell into that existing customer base. So th this is a company in the industry that has churn of 16 17% a year that has a churn closer to 5%. That's phenomenal. It's, it's, uh, and it's just, as I say, the most rewarding thing is it's just a great team of people. And to have seen them grow up like this, it's, 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 it's a lot of you know, personal satisfaction. That's great. That's an awesome story. Uh, I want to talk about one of your earlier investments or your later investments, but that's more earlier in stage. Right. Last time I was in New York, we sat down and you showed me a product that I just thought was fabulous. It was called 500PX. Right. Tell me about the thesis behind that investment. What excites you and why is this the next clout or cornerstone on demand? So, so one of the questions we you get... seem to be pretty good at picking them, so... <laughs> well, we have winners, we have losers, but it's a portfolio, and we've got some great companies in the portfolio. So 
Um, people talk about proprietary deal flow and their own connections and how they find companies. So, you know, we used a proprietary system uh, called AngelList. <laughs> and this is the first company we invested off AngelList, and it was hiding in broad daylight. I hope Nivi watches this. This yeah. is such a great endorsement. And it, no, it is. And, you know, I, I basically saw the company on AngelList. I went to the website, and my, one of my litmus tests is, do I, like, keep going back to that website? Does it just engage me? Now, I've always liked photography. And if you, if you want to put, you know, put yeah, it up on the screen, sure. just pull up 500px and pull up the popular page. These are some of the most gorgeous photos I've you know, ever seen. Okay, so go ahead and bring up my screen. And on the screen is a nice photo. And I'm going to click on the popular page here. Right. And if you look, if you scroll down, you can see these are just amazing photographs, crowdsourced from all over the world. And if you pick any one of them. Yeah, um, I'm going to pick one that I really liked. I remember looking at it on your iPad, and I became addicted. I stopped listening to you, and I started looking at photos. So if I you, mean, what a magnificent photo that is. <laughs> that's a great photo. And that's had how many views? 5,600 views. And if you go further down, you can And then so it looks like you're building a social network because I can follow Jade daily. Oh, there's a whole social network. So this how do we know, though, that he is the IP owner of that? And can I actually... Well, hold on. Go, go a little further down. I just okay. want to scroll. Stop here. Okay. So you can see that this was um, taken in May. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you moved. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to make it bigger for you. Hold on. Give me a sec here. Uh-oh. Give me a sec. I'll get back there, I promise. Okay. okay. So you can see it was taken in May. It was uploaded 13 hours ago. It's already had 350 social shares. Yeah. If you go down to the bottom of the page. Yeah. You can you can see the uh, keep going keep going. This had 22 pages of comments. Right. So a picture that captures the um, really the social network people who touch these pictures that, that gets enormous engagement in a short period of time. I have always argued that images I believe are the core of social networks. And long before Instagram came around, I had written a blog post about this, which is. You know, people talk about Web 2.0 being this era of two-way communication, and, and, and to some extent that's true, but two-way communication existed before. But the massive reduction in the cost of capturing media and sharing media, I believe, is what drove the growth of social networks. Because like, even I think how I look at Facebook now as I log in, I, I'm not a huge Facebook user as it happens, but I quickly scroll and look at the images to gain a snapshot of what's going on in people's lives. So. Um, I, I totally agree. I think images also, from a consumption viewpoint, are more valuable than video and audio. Because you can look at a picture, and, you, and within a few nanoseconds, you've read a story out of that picture. For a video or audio, you have to go from beginning, middle, to end, and it takes more time. So pictures you can consume rapidly. And yet, the iPad app yeah. uh, has an average 42 minutes engagement. Wow. I can't think of anything other than movies. That so people how did spend you find them? They're in Canada, did you tell yeah, me last so, time? Yeah, so they're in Canada. And so, you know, I basically called them up, spoke to them, uh, and really got quite excited. So I got on the plane. You know, it's amazing. Toronto is closer than Chicago. And yet when I spoke to other investors, people were put off. They were in Canada. They yeah. said no one's made money in pictures. And again, like clout, thinking a few years in the future, right? We all have these cameras we're carrying around yeah. with us. When I was growing up, a small percentage of the population had cameras. Now everyone has them. The quality is amazing. The post-production tools yeah. are on these devices. Yeah. And so what people, the number of high-quality images that are being created right. are enormous. What does the stories mean? I'm now on the section on the stories. So stories are, uh, is photo blogging. So it's a way for someone to take a series of images right. and put them together. Are these all story. different stories here? Yeah, so, so and then where do I click in? Do I just click on the image? Uh, click, so, uh, you see one more interesting? Yeah, click on, click on one of the images. Click on this one. Okay, this, this big one here? Yeah. Okay. And that will open it up. And you've got the picture, beautiful, gorgeous image. A hundred days right? old. Yeah. And these are pictures that this person's created a story, presumably around the new baby, 
uh, that's come out. They could put text around it. They could title it. Can you do private images or everything on here is by default public? So, yes, you can now do private images. Okay. And there's a whole interesting uh, growth side of this business that will come out probably by the first quarter on the private side. And it looks like there's a market, and so people that's part of the way you there's can monetize. Well, there's well over a million pictures available for sale today. So is this now competing with uh, iStock photos? Well, look at how stunning this is. Look at like this image here. That's just a stunning image. And by the way, so can, high quality. Yeah, for two hundred dollars. Yeah, you can buy that as a print. print on canvas. Which and these these pictures look gorgeous on canvas. Look for at three dollars a digital download. I think that's great. I th I think I've just found a way for you to. This um, is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we lost it. Hold on, let's try that again. Oh. Ah, that's okay. Okay. We'll, we'll have that. to call the bug department. I'll, right. I'll do it this way, but Kung Fu Frog, it's called. That would look good on my wall. Yeah. Um, so so the, the answer is, I think we're in the early stages of this. The number of pictures that are being created is growing. This is crowdsourced. It's in multiple languages. That picture could have been taken in Indonesia yeah. or could have been taken in Indiana. I'm going to call care. it now. 500px is going to be a big company. I, I said it in New York. I don't know why I didn't chase you faster. <laughs> Thank Bo you. Bottlenose. Tell me about Bottlenose. Nova Spivak. Yeah. Nova is just... He's one of the smartest guys I know. Yeah. And he's been involved in the forefront of a lot of things, a lot of technologies over, um, over a couple of decades. And, you know, we looked previously at, uh, a couple of years ago at his previous company, and we ended up not investing. And then towards the end of last year, he got me engaged um, to look at bottlenose, and it was intriguing. And since December, I'd sort of been tracking this company. Tell me what Bottlenose does. So Bottlenose is real-time discovery. So do you remember two years ago, there was this whole thing about real-time search? Yep. And the notion was you had to, like, One suck all this. And, yeah, but you had yeah. to suck all this data onto your servers, right, index it. Yeah. And then I'd come in and search that index. Yeah. Doesn't work. Yeah. So um, I don't say it doesn't work, but... From our perspective, it doesn't work. What if yeah. you could now, in the browser, do all the work? So if you have a million clients out there, you've got a million CPUs working for you. Put the analytics into the browser. And you know, if you, pu if you pull it up on the screen and take a current so, topic. Yeah, so I've got it up right now. And I want to tell you this story, though, okay. just before we go to the website. So okay. Nova was in my office last week. Right. And I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago. It's when the space shuttle was flying on the back of the 747. Right. And he was sitting in my office. And I happened to be in a part of LA where you, we've got great views of the whole city. It's 16th floor of a building. And uh, the plane was supposed to be flying overhead. So I asked the assistants in the office, I'm like, can someone find out when it's flying over? So everyone's looking on the web and no one could quite find when it was supposed to fly over because I didn't want to interrupt the meeting until it was flying right by our office. Right. And Nova said, well, why don't we look on Bottlenose? And he typed in space shuttle and he did a couple of hashtags and boom, we started getting a live feed from Twitter with people tweeting where it was. So we saw a tweet and it said uh, space shuttle over Santa Barbara on its way to LA. And so I'm like, well, it's going to be here in about 15 minutes. <laughs> and exactly what happened. Right. And, and they have an image yeah. section as well. So you'd see all the images Which is what that we people saw. were taking. So what do you want me to search on? I'm on Bottlenose. Give me That's something current. current. Anything current. Um, I guess I would say what's going on. The uh, apology by Tim Cook for uh, the Maps product. So put in Tim Cook. Okay. Tim Cook. And let's see what comes up. Bottlenose is loading, scanning social networks for trends. Apple CEO Tim Cook, I love India, without saying, let's see, there we go. he apologizes. So now, it pop oh, it's populating as we it's, speak. It's real time populating. You've got an image section, you have recent comments, which are recent tweets. Um, Where's the images section? Pictures, pictures. okay. So this is going to show me. An image-based view, I gather. So yeah. there's Tim. If I wanted to see him, yeah. and I can check the real-time stream. So this is what's happening in real-time. And go to Sonar. Okay. Sonar's really interesting. 
Sona is giving you a mind map. Whoa. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Sona is giving you a mind map and showing you each of the nodes that relate to that term. Yeah, here we go. I'm sorry. I scrolled in too f too quickly. Right. And so so you... I can see the big things that are related related to him. Tim related to Steve Jobs related to App Store. Right. And I presume I can then Click on find of one of these. I'm going to find iOS 6 and it changes. That's interesting. And I can say, show me about I.O. Oh, wow, I love that. So, oh, here it is, Apple Maps. And then from there on the right-hand side is the story we were looking for. Tim Cook apologizes for the Maps mess. Right. And from here, I guess, I can click in, and it's going to, oh, it doesn't take me to the store. It kind of frames the story, I guess. There's, so okay, it so it gives store. you a synopsis, and then I can read more. Yeah. And what's, in, what's interesting about Botanos is if you now, having gone through that experience, which is very interactive, yeah. go to Google and search for Tim Cook, you're, you're going to get a very different experience. Okay, well, let's try that in real time. So we just typed Tim Cook before, right? We didn't type anything else. So let's do the, well, we get the, the story, which is extremely sorry, and I could jump into that, but I have no social context around it. I can't see what people are saying in the stream. I can't branch out to other stories, but it looks like I do get at least the, the story. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. So we think Bottom Nose is in the early stages. It's a different platform in that it leverages everyone's computer who uses it. Anyone who's into analytics, mm -hmm. so media companies, CIA, Wall Street, and wants to know real time what's happening around a given subject, it's fascinating. If you're a brand managing a campaign and you want to know what's, what's actually happening, which keywords are working, which ones are not, What's being said about a given sneaker during the Olympics? What's being said about a given beverage during an event you're sponsoring? And then tracking that real time and then tracking it over time, those kind of analytics, we think it's pretty unique. As do I. Uh, I invest in a company that does just that. Um, I want to quickly bring a note from our sponsors, You've probably seen it running in the background as John and I have been talking, but our two sponsors of the show, we have Walker, Walker Corporate Law, which is at Scott Ed Walker, S-C-O-T-T-E-D-W-A-L-K-E-R. It's a boutique law firm that specializes in representing entrepreneurs. Um, I'm very active in following Scott because he writes a blog post that talks about a lot of legal issues. He puts a lot of value out for people, which uh, has been great. And I know he used to work for one of the big firms. I can't remember which, Wilson Cincini or one of the big ones, but he's now got his own practice. And Detroit Venture Partners, have you come across them? No, if not. So they specialize in Detroit. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they believe in the re revitalization of that city and that state overall. They're investing heavily in infrastructure, almost in the way Tony Shea is in Las Vegas, to try and create something sustainable in Detroit, which is great. You have a lot great. of great universities and people graduating from there. You know, we talk about the changes in the economy. The Industrial Revolution, I mean, Detroit kind of represents that. It was the place where we had this production scale uh, advantage to the city of Detroit and all the wealth that came from that with the decline of manufacturing base in the US, obviously it has suffered. And if, if we're going to transition to a modern economy, we need to rebuild from the core in places like Detroit. I, t I totally agree. And the cost of real estate uh, and, fo and, and a whole series of services will be significantly cheaper there. It'll advantage companies with so the right investment. If you want to learn more about Detroit Venture Partners, it's simply DetroitVenturePartners.com, and you can thank them on Twitter. They are at, at DVP Tweets. Um, so we're going to bring this uh, episode to a close. I guess I would summarize by saying you are an early stage, active, hands-on investor in the way that an angel would be, but with institutional money so that you can put more wood behind the deals, 
South, you invested seven times in Cornerstone On Demand, so it's not set it and forget it. You really right. follow your companies, and particularly, I guess, your winners. Um, you are geographically agnostic, or do you have certain areas you focus on? We're about 40% in New York, about a third on the West Coast. We've got a lot in between. We have three companies in Austin. I'll be there uh, later uh, next week. And um, But we are geographically agnostic. We Subject to... You know, just investing in a country that we feel um, we can rely on the cultural and legal system. Okay, I'd like to put one plug yep, in, if sure. I may. You may. We, we started an experiment. We've asked all of our portfolio company CEOs to blog once a month on our site. Now, with 42 active companies, that means that ffvc.com slash blog will have new content every day. And our objective is we have some really Can smart we bring folks. that up? Yep. And um, they have good things to say. But you, it's ba a you back Joe Lonsdale? Or he just happened to post on your site? So we're investors in Adapa. And so Joe posts on our site. And it's a really great blog about... Um, and I know Palantir, but what is Adapa? Adapa is one that seems to be one of the least sexy businesses around, which is providing effective back office software for family offices, hedge funds, and money managers. And it's actually a very complex problem mm -hmm. and a really interesting problem. I think it's going to be an amazing company. So in a way, you're trying to allow you, the companies you've invested in, instead of each trying to do micro blogs of which they may get some traction, the feeling is if you can bring them together at ffvc.com forward slash blog, you can gain a little bit more exposure because of the aggregation? Well, it, so there's the aggregation, which brings community, which means that if you want to understand us and understand our companies, you have one place to go. Right. The commenting we think will build up over time as people start bookmarking the page mm -hmm. and that's right next to our jobs page which if you click on that well i got your team's page on can you tell me who these other motley crew are so alex is um a partner and our cfo he has a tax legal and accounting background runs mm -hmm. our acceleration services team david um is um a partner he's involved with uh, sitting on boards, on uh, building our, our uh, own technological stack, working closely with our companies, helping them succeed. Uh, Michael Yavendidi is a venture partner, so I very part-time. Everyone knows Mike Yavendidi. Everyone knows Mike. And then this is the rest of the team. Ryan focused on, on recruiting. Uh, Mary. Well, stating the obvious, you've mm -hmm. done a very good job of gender and uh, socioeconomic and uh, cultural diversity here we try to be gender blind but one and i know we're coming towards the end so i want you to click on the jobs page sure because just as we're aggregating the blog we're also um aggregating jobs so if you want to work in one of our portfolio companies you're in the resumator we're in the resume. I didn't know that in Pittsburgh. So you work yeah. with uh, Rincon on that. Uh, yes, Rincon, Rincon was the lead investor. Yeah, they talk them up a lot. And you're in Thinknear, which is in Los Angeles. I know Thinknear. Yep. Interesting team. And so these are jobs that are open right now. Mm -hmm. And at a time where we have so many people unemployed. Well, this we... is great because I can easily find out who you've invested in. Local response, Nihal. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, we also have a a page with logos, because mm -hmm. we like to collect logos of the companies we invest in. But these are the job openings right now. And ah, I should have asked you about Live Fire. Why is, oh, you're in Gobbler too. I love yes. Gobbler. Yeah, I good. love them, they're yeah. great. Chris is a great guy. Why, um, why is Live Fire, how, do they diff, how are they different from Discuss? Right. Am I getting you in trouble if I ask? No, you're not getting me in trouble. Right. It's you, just... can, you can punt on that. Since no, no, it's... no, 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 I'll answer that. Um, yeah. uh, Discuss has been around for a number of years. Mm -hmm. They're the leading comment site. Mm -hmm. Life Fire has a different mission in life, mm -hmm. which is to be the leading conversation site on the web. They've started with comments, yeah. and they have won an enormous amount of business in a short period of time. Uh -huh. um, Jordan, the CEO, is just a phenomenal guy. The 
Um, I think they were on Business Insider saying that bookings mm -hmm. um, were growing tenfold year over year. Um, they've landed um, a really a, a golden list of corporate uh, newspapers um, and other sites to use them as a common stream, as well as you know thousands and thousands of blogs that use them for a free basis as their back end. We use them for free um, on our site, and it's very socially connected. And what's neat about it is the conversation happens in can happen in multiple places at the same time. Right. So. So it allows for distributed commenting. Distributed real-time Which commenting. Discuss has, I'm not sure that it gets implemented as much as I would like. But I, will, I will not compare and contrast the two yeah. products because I will then get myself into trouble. <laughs> uh, well, that's good. Anyway, we really should wrap this. I know that we could go for two hours, but we'll have to then set another date and do this again in a year. But it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. So thank you. thank you very much to the obvious people, which is... Walker Corporate Law and Detroit Venture Partners. Without them, we are not. Um, and in anyone who wonders, because I get asked from time to time, I don't take any money for the show. All of the money goes to the great production staff that, that produce the show. Um, but of course, I'd like to thank John Frankel for giving up part of his morning to talk to you. And thank you for having me here.